Hello everyone, this is Sirius Trivia, and today we're concluding our Sun Tzu lore series with episode 8 titled, What Could Have Been. So before we jump into this episode, I have to first state that unlike any of our Let's Talk Lore episodes on the channel, this episode will be solely based on my opinions as we are diving into the realm of alt history today. And while this is an exciting prospect, we are going to set some simple parameters to help keep the scope of our discussion limited and compact, or else this episode might never end. The only event we're going to alter today in our discussion is Sun Tzu's assassination, and the only world we will be exploring is the one in year 200, where Sun Tzu does not die and goes on to continue his previously planned attack on Cao Cao while Cao Cao was busy fighting Yuan Shao at Guandu. Now, there are some other interesting what-if scenarios that we could look at, like what if Sun Tzu's son, Sun Shao, had taken over instead of Sun Quan, or what if Sun Quan continued his brother Sun Tzu's plan to attack Cao Cao, but I feel like that's just going down rabbit hole best explored after we make a Sun Quan lore series of some sort. So, going back to the task at hand, as we jump into the alt history parallel dimensions where Sun Tzu does not get assassinated in May of the year 200. So, to understand this world, we have to kind of introduce the main conflict that Sun Tzu would be able to influence if he had been alive. And that is namely the Battle of Guandu, which is probably the second most influential battle during the entire Three Kingdoms period ranking only after the Battle of Tribi. And because of its importance, I'm fairly certain we will one day see a future chapter pack centered around this battle for the game Total War 3 Kingdom, which will also mean that I will definitely be doing a full Let's Talk lore series covering the events surrounding this battle in the future. So for the purpose of this episode, let's just cover the basics. In January of the year 200, the general of the chariot, Dong Cheng, who we have talked about earlier, is the nephew as the late Emperor Dowager Dong and the father-in-law to Emperor Liu Xie, he made an attempt on Cao Cao's life. This assassination failed, and the entire Dong clan, as well as many of the Han loyalists who all signed a blood oath together with the Emperor himself, were all killed in the aftermath of this failed assassination. This event however, did provide Yuan Shao with the perfect excuse to attack Cao Cao, as before this point, raising a sword against Cao Cao would be akin to raising a sword against the emperor. But now, given that the emperor himself had helped orchestrate an attempt on Cao Cao's life, Yuan Shao's attack would be no longer treasonous, but rather be seen by history as this attempt to restore the hunt. At the same time, other signers of this blood oath who were lucky enough to not be in the capital at the time of the failed assassination, like Liu Bei, also got to join Yuan Shao and declare war together on Cao Cao. And if you're interested in learning about what happened in the short war between Liu Bei and Cao Cao, I would highly recommend you to jump over to our Let's Talk Lore series titled When Guan Yu Joins Cao Cao to connect this event to the early stages of Guandu. But basically, long story short, Cao Cao won the first few rounds of this campaign, as Liu Bei was destroyed and forced to flee directly to Yuan Shao, and Yuan Shao's top generals of Yan Liang and Wen Chou both died at Cao Cao's hands. And despite a massive numbers advantage in terms of men, land, and supply, Yuan Shao was clearly not winning the war. By July, outraged by this fact that his generals had largely failed him in the fields, Yuan Shao mustered up a force of roughly around 100,000 to 120,000 men and marched south to the Yellow River, where he attempted to force Cao Cao out into a decisive final showdown. And Cao Cao responded by basically mustering all the forces he had available to him which amounted to roughly around 20,000 to 40,000 men. And these two forces met at a place called Guandu. Now the numbers here are very solid historically, and we can also know that Yuan Shao had much more than 100,000 troops in the north, 
as at the time he owned about four of the 13 provinces that made up China. And the four that he owned also happens to be the most populous and best food production. So on paper, Yuan Shao dominated Cao Cao, who had an incredible amount of soft political power up to this point due to his control of the emperor. But in terms of manpower, military capabilities, and food supply, Cao Cao's forces only totaled about 40,000 max. But Cao Cao had a few key advantages. First, he was fighting a defensive war, where he didn't have to venture north to actually fight Yuan Shao. Second, the 40,000 men or so that Cao Cao had are all battle-tested and seasoned veterans, who had not had much of a break since Cao Cao had been fighting non-stop to expand his territories and influence since 193, whereas Yuan Shao had gained control of the north in a much easier fashion by using his family's name and brand as his main tool to absorb many of the smaller factions. And lastly, Cao Cao could utilize all his manpower, whereas Yuan Shao ended up just sending a little more than 100,000 men, because you have to imagine the logistical nightmare of marching 100,000 men and supplying them with food, and at the same time, you still had Black Mountain bandits, Ma Teng to the west, and Xiong Nu to the north, who could all present potential problems for Yuan Shao if he had taken more men. So he definitely needed to leave forces behind to help defend his massive empire. So with the table set, Yuan Shao and Cao Cao entered into this stalemate at Guandu that is not too different from trench warfare of World War I, as both sides constructed encampments on the high grounds. And there were no glorious open field battles as Cao Cao remained defensive for the majority of the Battle of Guandu since he had about a fourth of Yuan Shao's men. We previously talked a lot about Cao Cao's advantages, but Cao Cao also had notable disadvantages. First, he clearly had much less troop, and to make this matter worse, Cao Cao couldn't even muster up enough food and supplies to supply his smaller number of troops to hold his defensive position for longer than three months, while Yuan Shao was able to bring enough food and supplies for over a year while maintaining a steady supplies of new material to continue to pour from the north. Cao Cao also had a rear with Liu Biao, who was technically Yuan Shao's ally, or at least friendly to Yuan Shao. And even though historically Liu Biao decided to stay neutral during this whole affair, Liu Bei, who was now working under Yuan Shao at this time, did travel south to Nanyang as a proxy for Yuan Shao to work with local yellow turbans like Liu Pi and Gong Du and their yellow turban forces there to try to divert Cao Cao's attention. And the attempts here worked for a while, but when Cao Cao finally decided to gamble by allowing Cao Ren to lead just 5,000 of his precious troops from the front back to take care of Nanyang, Liu Bei was soundly defeated as he was forced to return to Yuan Shao, with nothing to show for it. And it was actually this failure that historically helped convince Liu Bei to abandon Yuan Shao in the end, by using the excuse that since he and Liu Bei are both related to the emperor, perhaps he could be the best candidate to persuade Liu Bei to join Yuan Shao's side, so Liu Bei used this excuse as a way out from under Yuan Shao's court. But we can extrapolate that if a group of yellow turban remnants under the command of Liu Bei could have caused such a headache for Cao Cao, as he couldn't really spare any men from the front line given the huge disparities in manpower, then if the main character of our story, Sun Ce, had not died, but instead brought his armies north through the weakly defended rear of Cao Cao's territories to strike at the capital of Xu Chang, where the emperor resided in, Cao Cao would have surely lost Guandu, as his defensive positions was along a small river to the north, so losing his southern flank would make his defensive position completely worthless. Cao Cao would also not be suspecting an attack from Sun Ce, either since he believed his appeasement strategy would have worked, given that his cousin Cao Ren had married his own daughter to Sun Kuang, 
and his son Cao Zhang has taken in Sun Ben's daughter as wife. Now, in the aftermath of Cao Cao's defeat at Guandu in this hypothetical world from Sun Ce and Yuan Shao's combined attack, this would have devastated Cao Cao. Sun Ce, on the other hand, well, unlikely to be able to name himself some sort of powerful regent, given that Yuan Shao would be the main victor from this battle. He would surely receive quite a nice gift from Yuan Shao to thank him for being that force to crush Cao Cao from the rear. And for Yuan Shao himself, he would naturally take on the role of Cao Cao as he would likely become the next prime minister or some sort of regent role. He would likely also move the emperor from Xuchang back to his stronghold in Ye up in the north and establish this new imperial court while flooding it with his own men as the new officials. Cao Cao, on the other hand, would probably be able to survive his defeat, but his situation would be very dire as Yuan Shao would have branded him as a traitor, and the continued manhunt for Cao Cao's defeated army, who had struggled with supplies even at the beginning, uh, would not be able to hold any territories, and many of the smaller warlords would probably come out and hunt him down. And many of Cao Cao's own advisors and generals would probably also defect, as there were historical evidence that after the Battle of Guandu, when Yuan Shao had been defeated, Cao Cao recovered this huge chest of correspondence letters between Yuan Shao and those in his own imperial court and in his own military ranks that voiced opinions that people were thinking about joining Yuan Shao after he defeats Cao Cao because they knew that the disparity in manpower was just simply too great. So historically looking back, Cao Cao's victory here was just a miracle and we'll talk about that when we get a full lore series on Guandu. But if we change a small detail, let's say Sun Ce doesn't die and come in here and not necessarily help out Yuan Shao, but just to defeat Cao Cao, who represented a dominant force because he held the emperor. By doing so, we will have this new world where we will get a map that will look something like this, I believe. From the north, Yuan Shao would be the dominant power. He would hold seven provinces stretching from the northern boundaries of the realm into the central plains after absorbing all of Cao Cao's territories. Out west, Yuan Shao would still have a few enemies in the form of Cao Cao's remaining men, the Black Mountain Bandits who I don't see as potential people who would surrender to Yuan Shao. Ma Teng and Han Sui would also be on the bad side because they had sided with Cao Cao during the conflict of Guandu. Now they might switch sides, but they're so far out west, I don't think they're going to play a major influence on the political system at this point, given how strong Yuan Shao would likely be. Down to the southeast, Sun Ce would gain control of the Xu province on top of the Yang province. Now there could be a situation where Yuan Shao might want to curb back Sun Ce's power, but at the very least, he would definitely have the full control of the Yang province, I believe. Liu Biao would still be entrenched in the Jin province. And for the time being, I actually don't see Yuan Shao as being the type to rush to turn on Sun Ce and Liu Biao to seek this unification. Because he will likely play the political game, use his brand, and get himself positions, flush out the court. He had to clean out of Cao Cao's remaining allies inside the court, build his own imperial court back in Ye. So there will be a time of peace as Yuan Shao needs to consolidate this newly gained land and power. And during this time period, I think Sun Ce would serve himself to actually engage in a period of border skirmishes or war with Liu Biao, as he can always rely on the excuse that Sun Jian, his father's death, had strained this relationship and provide this feud without causing him to feel too ambitious by trying to take the territories of the Jin province. And perhaps one character we're really ignoring here is Liu Bei, because he did run off to Liu Bei at this point. But no matter how you look at things, I don't think Liu Bei can rise from this conflict. Maybe Liu Bei would die of old age, but even in that case, we see it from history. The gentry classes, the Huang clans, the Tai clans, they're not going to let Liu Bei take over as they didn't let him take over in romance or in history. 
So it's hard to see where Liu Bei would rise here, and without this invasion of Cao Cao into the territories of Jin province and eventually Wu causing the Grand Battle of Chibi, which really gave Liu Bei second life. I think Liu Bei would just live out his days under Liu Bei's court. Maybe he'll make something of himself, but just hard to tell. And as for Sun Ce, he needs to play his cards right at this point. He needs to pay respect to the imperial court, act like a good citizen, and just wait out Yuan Shao because he's so much younger. Now, historically, Yuan Shao died quite soon after the defeat at Guangdu, but that's probably due to the embarrassment of the defeat as well as depression caused by the defeat. But let's say he won, life is good, he gets to live a few more years. But he's up there in age, and once he dies, he will face the same problem as he faced in history. His sons will fight with each other, and in this case. There is even more things for his sons to fight for, and Yuan Shao's historical distaste for his eldest son Yuan Tan is going to come back and haunt his clan. And if the Yuan clan fractures here, Sun Ce can easily come in and ally himself with Yuan Tan, who is located just due north of Sun Ce's position in the Qing province, to launch this justified war against the rest of the Yuan clan in the north. And given how incapable Yuan Shao's sons proved to be against Cao Cao historically, I would give Sun Ce a pretty good chance of winning this fight for Yuan Tan, who would end up owing his position at the end to Sun Ce as they would reclaim the capital of Ye and the emperor once again. And at this point, I believe there wouldn't be any dominant players left to challenge Sun Ce. He could easily bring down Yuan Tan if he wanted, just backstab him at the end. And with control of the emperor, and the only opponent being the likes of Liu Bao, who's also very old, and Liu Bei, who has nothing at this point, and with the full control of the east, north, and the south, I feel like he can go on do great things, whether he want to make himself an emperor or a regent. So while it's been fun exploring this parallel universe where Sun Ce doesn't die, I would also like to point out a few things about this scenario. And the analysis of this historical period as a whole is that if we go on this fun ride, what's going to happen throughout the country is that it's going to engulf the country and the people there in more wars. So just remember that to keep things in perspective. As we wrap up here,、uh, using that logic, the another scenario that I personally believe would have been better overall is that if Cao Cao had actually won the battle tribute and united the country right there. And that would have heralded in the Wei Dynasty way earlier, and the country and the people. No matter your people of Wu, people of Shu, people of Wei, doesn't matter where you are. It would have been just peacetime, and things would have been a lot better. And Cao Cao, his son Cao Pi, and his grandson Cao Rui, all proved to be great rulers. And without the rise of the Sima Clan, given that there wouldn't be any conflict to give rise to Sima Yi in terms of military power. And the eventual Eight Princes Saga would probably be avoided. Perhaps the whole country would have been spared for 400 years of chaos, as we know Cao Cao handled the Northern Nomads quite capably. But perhaps that's a course we will never know. So this officially wraps up our Sun Ce lore series. But we will return soon with a special series covering the Twelve Tiger Generals of Wu, which will feature many of the same great generals that fought alongside Sun Jian and Sun Ce. As well as some later generals that served under Sun Quan, and even though the term Twelve Tiger Generals of Wu is definitely not as famous as the Five Tiger Generals of Shu or the Five Elites of Wei, but this list does contain some of the greatest Wu generals of the Three Kingdoms period. So I'm hoping to finally shed some light on them with this upcoming lore series, which will showcase each one with a short story, highlighting their greatest achievements during the area and talking about their life. So definitely look forward to that. As I plan to have that ready by this weekend. Once again, thank you all for watching this series. I hope you all enjoyed it, and see you all next time. Bye.